begin this evening. Before we go to our classes, let's all take a psalm book and turn to number 652. 652. And after we sing this song, I'll ask Brother Bill Willard to come and lead us in our opening prayer. There is. Heavenly Father, we come before thee tonight with thanksgiving, Father. We're thankful for another day thou hast given us, Father. We're thankful, Father, for the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. We're thankful for thy love, Father, thy concern toward all mankind. And Father, we're thankful for the church that you read out of the Bible and that we're members of thy body. And we pray that the church will increase in a number. And we'll be busy in the vineyard in proclaiming the word of God. Be with us as we journey through life, Father. Be with this congregation, Father. Be these good elders that lead and feed this flock. Be with Brother Aaron as he proclaims the word from time to time, and all gospel preachers who are preaching the word of God, and all good elderships over thy people. Be with those that are sick, Father. Be with the Qualls family, the loss of their loved one. And be with others that are suffering, Father. We know that there are many that are suffering and are sick, but Father, we pray that they'll get to doing better and They'll continue to put their trust in thee. Be with us in our journey, Father. Help us ever to look unto thee and not give up and be faithful, Father. Help us not to be disheartened but encouraged because we have the word of God and we have the church. We're members of thy body. And we can be faithful, Father, until the end. Be of thy people everywhere, Father. Forgive us of our sins. In the name of Jesus we pray and amen. Well, good evening to everyone. Welcome to our midweek Bible study, and also welcome to those that are watching and listening online. Glad to have all of you with us this evening. We had a beautiful day, haven't we? We stand a few more, right? 
quite a contrast from just 10 days ago or whatever it was. We're studying from the Gospel of John, and we started last week uh, with um, an overview, and then I read the, let me get my thing going here, read the first 18 verses of John, which is considered the prologue, um, if I don't get my glasses on, we'll be reading a bunch of blurry stuff, we don't want to do that. <clears throat> Bear with me when I get till I get situated here. I'm still learning the ropes on some of this. And um, we expanded mainly on the first three verses, and I want to touch on them one more time. So if you'll turn with me to John chapter 1, we're going to read the first five verses. And uh, there's a couple other things I want to add to what we've already discussed. The first three verses that set, set at rest all controversy concerning the divine nature of Jesus Christ. That the Word who was afterwards manifest as the Christ existed before creation began. That the Word was present with God. That the Word was divine. That Jesus was the Word. And that by or through Him all things were made that were made. Jesus was before the foundation of the world. Turn with me in Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Paul to the church of Ephesus. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, this does not affirm that God chose some individuals and rejected others, but that before the world was, before there was Jew or Gentile, God chose to have people, a people for himself, a people that glorify him, the whole church of Christ, a covenant people confined to no one earthly race. If we went out on the streets tonight and just went up to the average John Q. public, and asked them, when did the Messiah, when did the Son of God, the Word, the Christ, or other titles that we have for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when did he come into existence? What kind of answer do you think we would get? There would be a lot of people who said, well, I don't know, a couple thousand years ago. Well, he came when the Gospels, when we got the Gospels, right? Or he came, I don't know, a thousand years ago. But one thing I know is on December the 25th, right? We probably hear that a lot. And we know that's not technically correct. So there's a lot of people, and, and I, I'm not sure that I, I fully think about this all the time. When, when we read of God and his glory and his power and his might, do we connect the three together, the Godhead? But we have to think of it that way, you know. Uh, Christ has been here, part of God, is God, from the beginning. So many people are uneducated in the Word and only relate to the incarnate of our God, and that would be at Jesus' birth, right? That's what, that's what people cling on to. When Jesus was born, that's when he began. Okay, I don't think that uh, a lot of uh, even Christians think back that he was here. It's just that he became incarnate when he was born. Jesus is God. Jesus lived a perfect life because he was God. In his, in his physical being and being here, he's God. And that's the thing I think sometimes we even as Christians forget about. But I want to go back to John. Uh, when he opens up his story, he borrowed from the opening line from Moses and Genesis to take us back to show us how Jesus participated in God's creative work in the past, but it's also showing us how God is bringing about a new creation. So what is this new creation? It's the precious souls that have been reconciled to God, lost souls that were living in darkness but have been born again, 
have experienced a new birth by becoming a child of God. And this, my friends, is what the whole Gospel of John is about. As we move forward in our studies, we will see that. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. And it reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. In Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So those that are outside the body of Christ still have yet to experience that new birth, that new creation, being born again, giving their life to Christ. Believe in the Bible and have faith. Hear the word, believe, repent, confess, and then be baptized into Christ. In reading uh, the first three verses here, or first five verses, which I didn't do, go back to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The word was with God. Go with me now to 1 John 1 and 2. First John 1, verse 2, The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. John reveals that Jesus and God are not identical in personalities, but they are one. John 14, 6. Turn with me there, if you will. 14, 26, I'm sorry. And here we're talking about the Holy Spirit. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And Jesus here talking about a different identity in the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes whom I shall send to you from the Father. This is Jesus. When the Helper comes, that I, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. This is a dec declaration of Christ's deity, not as an attribute, um, but as a distinct person. He, Jesus, is himself God in the same sense to the same degree that the Father is to God. There is one God, one divine nature consisting of three distinct persons. We find this in the Great Commission in Matthew 18. I should be able to tell that to you without looking, but I want to make sure that I... 18 through 20, make sure I get it right. But surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I just told you all wrong. Matthew 28, I'm sorry. Getting backwards here, getting my chapters for my verses. Matthew 28, 18, 20, the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. In verse number four, uh, well first, in verse number three, the word, Jesus was the agent of all creation, God was the source, 
and Jesus commenced the work. All things were made through him. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. We'll turn there. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things through him, whom are all things and through whom we live. In verse 4, note that life is, is not said to have been created. Life existed in Christ. Death could not hold him because in life it could not, could not hold him because in him is life and he became resurrection and life for us. In Psalm 36, 9, we read, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And this we're talking about Christ. For with Christ is a fountain of life. In his light we see light. The life that Christ bestows enlightens men. He is the light of the world. His light chases away darkness of the earth. Though when John wrote, the world did not receive it. When in darkness has eyes and saw not. All history demonstrates that Christ is the light of the world. Every redeemed soul recognizes the fact. In a very familiar verse is John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Christ entered this dark world to give it spiritual life. Isaiah 9 and 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Bear with me just a minute. Make sure I got that right. Okay. So this light can mean to comprehend is a word that I'm sure I have the right verse here. But anyway, had some notes about it. Uh, although Satan and his force forces resist the light, they cannot prevent its power. And now we'll go to John chapter or John one chapter one and verse six and read through 6 through 13 and begin talking about John the baptizer. Anybody want to have any comments about the first five verses that we've talked about really two nights now, I guess. I kind of expanded on it last week and touching on it again this week as a review more than anything. So then we see about John the baptizer or John the Baptist. Um, we don't see as much description about John the Baptist in the Gospel of John as we do the Synoptic Gospels. But uh, we understand what his, I, I'm not, it seems to me like we have more about his work uh, in the Gospel of John. I haven't really compared the Synoptic Gospels with the Gospel of John to see exactly how. But as we read here, 6 through 13, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. Like I heard Brother Aaron had that in part of his sermon this past Sunday. So John the Baptist was Christ's forerunner. He perceived the Lord in birth, in ministry, in death. He came to bear witness of the true light, he was called the Baptist because he baptized those who came to him professing repentance. I know some people 
would like to take that and tie it to the denomination, but that's not the case. John was a man sent from God. Jesus was the light. John was the lamp that bore witness to the light. In my studies, I've come up that John preaching was about 26 to 28 A.D., shortly before Jesus began his ministry. There was some overlap uh, of the two. In those days, John came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. It is likely that he also preached in Perea, east of the Jordan River. Perea, like Galilee, lay within the jurisdiction of King Herod. King Herod would later have John arrested. This King Herod is, uh, would be the King Herod Antipas was the son of King Herod the Great. You can read a lot about the story of John the Baptist in uh, Luke chapter 1. We read uh, that he was born to Zacharias and Elizabeth. They had no child. Elizabeth was barren and they were both well stricken and in their years. Zacharias was a priest and his wife Elizabeth was of the daughters of Aaron and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. Zacharias' lot as a Levite was to burn incense. You know, the Levite uh, people worked in the temple and his, his lot, it says, or his job was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. It was there that an angel of the Lord appeared unto Zacharias standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now you remember if you read over in uh, Matthew and Mark, uh, John was a, a pretty burly guy, right? He covered in camel hair and had leather belt and he ate locust and wild honey. Of course he lived in the wilderness. Um, but he was able to get people to come and ask for forgiveness and for repentance through his teaching and preaching. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. The angel told him to fear not. Thy prayer was heard, and that Elizabeth shall bear him a son, and his name shall be John, and they shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. In verse 15 of Luke 1, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall not drink neither wine nor strong, strong drink and that he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And at verse 15, when it talks about strong drink, it talks about, when you go back in Numbers chapter 6 and read, uh, strong, drink, strong drink could even meet vinegar and other uh, drinks like that, not, not necessarily a, an alcoholic type beverage like there is today. There wasn't anything produced like that during this time. Verse 16 says, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to, Lord, to the Lord their God. Verse 17, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of life to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The power of Elijah, or Elijah is from 1 Kings. Zacharias asked the angel how he would know. Everybody needed a sign, right? I mean, um, all the Jews, anything they were told, they was always looking for a sign. Zacharias asked the angel how he would know that he was old and stricken in years. The angel Gabriel told John that he stood in the presence of God and was sent to speak unto him and to show him these glad tidings. But then John still doubted. And when he did, in verse 20, Gabriel, the angel, took away John's speech because he didn't believe his words. John would remain mute until, um, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Zacharias would remain mute until John's birth. In verse 24, after those days, Elizabeth conceived and hid herself for five months. Not real clear why she hid. One commentary I read is that she did not go out into society both from delicacy and that she might have more um, for time for devotion. Does anybody want to expand on that a little bit or expand on that? Have I missed something here? <laughs> so she hid herself for five months in pregnancy. <clears throat> in Luke 1, 36, we learn that Elizabeth was a relative or close kinsman of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And in a lot of 
places, you know, they talk about cousins. Cousins not necessarily mean the same thing then as they do now, but they were relatives. It could have been very distant cousins. Like I have cousins, you have cousins. I come from two sides of large families, and I have cousins. I'm sure a lot of you are the same way. I don't even know. And that's kind of what we're going to see here when John the Baptist is out baptizing and, and not totally familiar with what's been going on with Christ is because they've had distance, right? So that's kind of the same thing uh, here when we talk, when they're referred to as cousins, as you'll see in a lot of uh, commentaries. When the angel was explaining to Mary about her conception of the Messiah, the angel told Mary that her relative Elizabeth had conceived John and she was now in her sixth month of pregnancy, thus making John, the Baptist, about six months older than Jesus. As you recall, Mary had rose and went into, uh, without haste into Judah, and as she entered the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the babe, John, leaped in her room in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit Jesus and John were both named by the angel Gabriel prior to their birth every time I read that where the babe leaped in her womb my mind automatically goes to all these babies that are, are being boarded I, I just it just takes me there and it, it's just a sad note because you think the same thing you know this baby this is six months and uh and he received the Holy Spirit, and a lot of them today are, are not being able to see the light. So it's a sad situation. And not much is known about John the Baptist's early years. Um, very confusing when you start, and you probably picked up on it already because I've already messed up a time or two here talking about John. We start talking about John the Baptist, and this is the Gospel of John. This story is from the God, from John the Apostle. And he, of course, he's not naming himself in the story at all, but. Sometimes when you start reading John and you see John and, and things like that, you got to kind of remember the Apostle John's telling the story. John the Baptist is being referred to here as John. So it can get a little bit confusing. All four Gospels are unanimous in the fact that John lived in the wilderness of Judea. The wilderness, as you recall, is where God had dwelled with his people after the Exodus. Ever since it had been the place of religious hope for Israel, there John was raised, and Luke 180 speaks of his raising in that he grew and became strong in spirit. There he was called by Luke 3.2, and there he preached Mark 4.1. In verse 7 that we just read, John came not so much as a reformer, but as a witness. His, he's the bear witness of the Messiah that was coming. John the Apostle was the eyewitness of seeing everything that was going on. That Jesus, the work of Jesus and the work of, of uh, John the Baptist. His work, as declared by Malachi, was to be a messenger to go before the Lord in all his preaching, and he testified of Christ. He pointed his own disciples to Jesus. In verse 8, He preached that he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. In Matthew 3 and 11, if you'll turn with me there. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In verse 9 of John 1, that, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world, that the true light that was those that are coming into the world, the true light was Christ. Verse 10, the world was made by him and they did not recognize him, his own people, his own uh, Jewish people, Israelites, they slammed the door in his face. In Matthew 15, verse 13, this is Jesus. 
But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Talking about those that didn't receive him. In verse 11, his own Jewish brother, brethren had rejected him even to the point of them crucifying the Lord. The religious leaders of that day rejected both Jesus and John. In verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. We have that same right today. There's still a lot of people not taking advantage of that right to become children of God. A lot of people. And a lot of people that were children of God have fallen away. That's where the church comes. That's where we come in. To get to continue to be the light um, that Christ has allowed us to be, to be the children of God and to go out into the world and take those, these folks out of darkness and sin and show them the light. There was, however, some that received the illuminating light of Jesus. These were the ones that Jesus gave the right to become children. Galatians 3 and 26, 27, if you'll turn there with me. This is sons and heirs. For all are you, for you all, I can't talk now. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself, just as He is pure." Verse 13. <clears throat> Talked about becoming children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. Jesus says the very same thing in John 3, 5, and 6. Unless... One is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that born of the Spirit is Spirit, born of God. The new birth, being dead to our sins and having put on the new life in Christ, is not brought on about by the blood or of an individual or by natural reproduction powers of the flesh, neither because man wills it so. In the new birth, God does the begetting. In James 1.18, he says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. The word of truth by which God begets is the gospel. God's power to save everyone who believes. In Romans 1.16, another verse that many of us could quote from the heart. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. 1 Corinthians 4.15 For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Anybody have any comments or questions about... Uh, Verses 6 through 13. Verse 12 and 13 kind of uh, opens the door for the Gentiles as well. That's right. As you proceed on uh, in the other books, uh, 
all deals with this. It, it's, you know, the gospel was for, to everyone that believes. And so this just kind of opens that door to the Gentiles. That's right. And, and I don't know that I've been able to find in there um, where John the Baptist baptized Gentiles. Does anybody kind of comment on that? Was he just baptizing? Was it just the Jewish people coming to, to him for baptism, for repentance? I know that uh, the priests were sent to John uh, to question him on basically who he was and what he was doing. Right. We're going to be getting into that. But it's not recorded that he uh, but the, not say whether he baptized Gentiles or not. No. Right. I haven't been able to find that that's the case. Um, I know. Somebody can, we'll, we'll do some more research on that. But it, I think we're you know, mainly talking about the Jewish people here. So let's go to verse number 14. And let's see here. You know, when I start studying, <clears throat> there's a lesson in every verse, every Every scripture, there could be a lesson. And what I've uh, struggled with in putting this together, especially tonight, is that, as Joe would say, and Joe's not here, as Joe would say, you know, every verse is, is highly inspired. We know that. The inspired word of God is accurate. It's truth. It is God-breathed. It has the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's, that, it's not just... And you know, and it's through these writers that this is this has happened. The Bible has come to be. So every word is an inspired word of God. And what I struggle with is when I start reading a uh, a series of verses like we spent already two nights almost on the first three or four verses. Is there's so much that you want to know that you can know, and you know, uh, like every scripture can be a lesson. So. I struggle with trying to narrow that down where we can move on because 10 years from now I still won't be <laughs> trying to finish up the Gospel of John. But at the same time, it's like Joe said too, it's hard to get in a big hurry and move over things that you don't, don't want to expand on because everything is so important. So bear with me. Like I said, I, my teaching experience is you could put it in a thimble, I guess. So um, I'm still trying to learn how to manage my my time and, and my scriptures and Main thing is is to be sure that I present the word as the truth, and uh, we all get something out of it. Randy, yes. You know that Christ sent in the limited commission; he sent his disciples to the Jews only. So. Right. Uh, well, that, we're not told whether John baptized Gentiles or not, but we know that Christ sent to the Jews only. Right. Okay. Thank you, Bob. I think I had read a comment where somebody thought that uh, when you read commentaries, you have to be careful. I have some good men that I, that I use for commentaries. I try not to use commentary. I try to figure it out on my own, you know, but I don't want to, I want to be right, okay? Um, and usually I'll use two or three good uh, Bible scholars of the church, and if they all kind of agree what's going on, and I agree with it, I'm good to go, but sometimes you get, you know, something thrown in there. Well, you know, it's possible that Gentiles were being baptized at the same time. So that's kind of the reason I, I threw that out there. As we get over into about chapter 3, it talks about, yes. We, so many people, spend too much time on what is, what if. Yeah. If God had wanted us to know, he'd have told us. Right. Let's study what he has given us. And don't let's suppose if so and so had to happen. Right. We don't know, and it certainly has no bearing on our salvation. That's right. There's a lot of things you just roll on with. <laughs> accept it at face value and, and move on and, and accept it as the truth. Yeah, you can, uh, like, like I said last week, sometimes I get a little over analytical, so um, my wife will tell you that. There, you know, I sometimes just, I was born in Missouri, I guess. You know, stubborn. <laughs> I hope I offend, offend anybody born in Missouri, but um, sometimes you just uh, think think too hard on things. 
wear it out. So beginning with verse 14, and we'll go through verse 16. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This statement identifies Jesus as appearing at a definite point in time in the form of human flesh, which we know. Here He is deity become incarnate. Say that word right, incarnate. He existed in the form of God, Philippians 2. If you'll turn with me there, Philippians 2, we'll read 5 through 11. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In verse 15, John the Baptist cried out, This is him that I have been preaching about. John was born before, yet Jesus was before John. Again, Jesus existed from eternity. In verse 16, Of His divine glory, His grace and truth has blessed us all. Grace or or favor has been added to grace. One blessing piled upon another. And what is grace? God's unmerited favor expressed to sinful humankind in the person of Jesus Christ apart from any human works or worth. Ephesians 1 and 23. Let's read that real quick. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Grace upon grace. We're blessed, aren't we? Verse 17, the superiority of Jesus is seen in the fact that he offers better things than that of the old Mosaic law. Go back to John 1. In 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Kind of read it backwards there. The law of Moses was not a system of grace, nor could it make men perfect. It contrasts with a system of grace and truth that was given by Jesus Christ. The law of Moses did not offer the forgiveness of sin. Whereas the truth, the truth revealed by Christ through grace of God did offer the forgiveness. Hebrews 9, 11 through 15. Let's turn there. We'll read this and then be time. <clears throat> Hebrews 9, 11 through 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For with the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer Sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. 
How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason he is a mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the uh, promise of the eternal inheritance. And then verse 18, we'll do this, we'll start right there when we come back next Wednesday. Appreciate you listening and uh, interjecting thoughts for us. And appreciate all the good comments that the encouragement I received in my teaching, which is, like I said, is something kind of out of my comfort zone a little bit, but hopefully we're getting something out of it.
I'm glad everyone can make it out here tonight and join us. The song of invitation will be 462. 462. Tonight I'd like to spend just a minute and talk about how great will heaven be. You know, Aaron said the other day, I don't know what you picture heaven to be, but whatever it is, it's going to be better. You know, to get to heaven, we're going to have to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We're going to have to be his disciple. So tonight, what is the cost of a discipleship? If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 14, and we'll be starting in verse 25. Once again, it's Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to war against another king, does not sit down and first consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all he has cannot be my disciple. So here we see that Jesus is going to be first in our lives. If we're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, he's going to be our top priority. He's going to come before our family. He's going to come before ourselves. He's going to come before our work. There's nothing that's going to become, come above Jesus. And also we see that we're going to bear our cross daily to follow him. You know, and today I think we have a kind of maybe a skewed view of the cross. At least I know I do most times. I think of the cross and it's this wonderful, glorious thing. It's, uh, we see it on necklaces, earrings, tattoos. The cross is a great symbol today. But if you think of the minds of the men and women he's telling this to, the cross is terrible. That is one of the most awful ways man has constructed to kill somebody. Bearing that cross is humiliating because you're on your way to death. The cross is literally a death sentence. And that is how serious Jesus is saying, this is to follow me. You will pick this up and carry it daily. You know, and Jesus tells us that we're going to have to count these costs. You know, to follow him, you're going to have to give stuff up. You may have to let go of that friend or give that relationship that you hold so dear. You know, a, a parent to a child may have to, they may have a sword with, between each other, fight with each other and no longer have that relationship and vice versa. And also maybe a spouse. You know, we have these different things that we have to give up because Jesus, he demands to be first. You know, that kind of leaves the question, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth all these things that we enjoy in this earth? Without a doubt, we can absolutely say yes. And we sing a song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. You know, this life is only temporary, and the decisions we make can get us to heaven, those are eternal. Paul tells us to live as Christ and to die as gain. He was torn. He said, I want to stay here, I want to do the good, but boy, when I die, I'm going to be in heaven, and that is going to be wonderful. You know, in Christ, he counted the cost. He decided that we were worth it. He left heaven. He came down and lived a perfect example for us and died on the cross so that we could have a hope to live with him eternally. So tonight, if you've obeyed the gospel and for some one reason or another stumbled and fallen away, we have a chance to make that right. We'd love to pray for you and with you. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel, tonight you have that opportunity. There's no promise it's going to be easy. It does come with the cost. But we can do it together, and I promise it will be worth it. If you have any of these needs, please come. Together we stand and sing.
certainly been good to see everybody here tonight for our midweek Bible study. Hope to see you back again at uh, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for uh, our Bible study and uh, 10 for worship, 5 o'clock Sunday evening for our evening worship. And we do have some visitors with us. Appreciate your presence tonight. Hope to see you back again. Uh, let's keep uh, those uh, in our prayers, those who are sick or shut in. Uh, as was mentioned last Sunday, uh, Sister Lisa Qualls has passed away, so let's keep her and her family, or keep her family in our prayers, that is. Um, Sister Eileen Brown fell and uh, broke some bones in her wrist, and she is staying with uh, Pat uh, Oswald, so uh, keep her in our prayers as well. Um, I believe I may have seen where Sister Shirley Dodson uh, was coming home. Is she home? Okay, so she is home now from the hospital, so that's good. Uh, let's keep her in our prayers, and I believe uh, she would love to have some phone calls, so let's be sure and try to contact her. Uh, it's good to have the Spurlocks back with us. Uh, Ross's dad uh, took a fall and uh, broke his ankle. Yeah, he's, he's, doing better. he's doing better. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, Sister Tammy Honeycutt is not here tonight. Her mom uh, is in the hospital uh, at uh, NEA. She had some blood pressure issues, and they're going to be running some tests on her. And um, Brother Joe's not here tonight. Um, I haven't heard. Uh, uh, normally, he's always here unless he's out of town. He did have to go to Pine Bluff. Okay, thank you, Brother Aaron. Uh, on that note, um, let's remember uh, Joe Jr., his son, uh, in our prayers. He's having some more health issues. Let's don't forget, um, coming up quickly, March the 14th through the 17th is our gospel meeting with Brother Barry O'Dell. Uh, we have plenty of flyers on the table there in the foyer. Please take some and, and uh, hand those out and mail those out uh, so that we'll have uh, a good number here. And in conjunction with that, on the 13th uh, of March, that's the Saturday uh, before the gospel meeting, we're going to do some door knocking. So we're going to meet at the building here at 1 p.m. on the 13th. Uh, and one thing that I did miss, we're having a work day this coming Saturday, 9 a.m. here at the building. Um, just a few things that we're going to be doing. I do have a list here that we can work off of uh, Saturday um, there's some, some toilets that need some uh, work done to them. Um, checking some of the exit doors, make sure they're working properly. Um, cleaning the yard, pressure washing. Brother Aaron, if you can bring your pressure washer. Uh, we need to do some cleaning outside. Um, ladies, if you're wondering what you can do uh, as well, uh, we need to go through the, the pantry items and see if there's anything expired. And then we're going to be doing some painting um, here in the next little bit in the annex, uh, starting there. And uh, we're gonna need the, the walls, anybody can do this, the walls kind of clean, wipe down, and then uh, putting some painter's tape uh, on everything in there. So that's just kind of a list of the things that we'll be doing Saturday at nine o'clock. Hope to see everybody there. And I think that's all the announcements that I, that I have. Malcolm, would you dismiss us in prayer? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to thee for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have to come tonight to this midweek Bible study and to learn more about your word. We pray, Father, that you'll be with those who are sick that we know of and pray that you'll be with those who have lost loved ones and comfort them as only you can. We pray, Father, that We'll always look to you for strength and guidance, and we thank thee for Jesus Christ who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for our sins. Pray that you'll go with us, watch over us. These things we pray in Christ's name.